Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kay and I'm a grateful member of the Worldwide Fellowship of Al-Anon. Hi. I think it only fitting that I start this morning by saying, I thank you, God. Did Marianne light up our life last night or what? (laughs) You know, the astounding thing is, is that she has looked like that, dressed like that, talked like that from the very first time I ever met her. It's just amazing. She goes on and on. She's like that little bunny, on and on and on. I am. Uh, I want to thank the Music City Roundup Committee for extending the invitation to fly me across country here to tell you things today that I swore to myself a long time ago I would never tell anyone. Uh, I'm in the land of goo goo clusters and moon pies. <laughs> You know, I have to be truthful because I, I haven't, things have not changed, uh, and my hostess know this, since yesterday. You know, I've laid out this candy and I'm, and I'm observing it. I, I don't quite know what to do with it. I, I haven't got around to taking it out of the wrapper and tasting it. The moon pie especially, I pushed on the top of it, and, uh, the texture is a little bizarre for me. I, you know, I push down and then it comes back up of its own will. And I, so I thank you, the committee, for the thought. And uh, <laughs> uh, if you will allow me just one moment, you know, I have a little lonely place in my heart today. Um, today is my husband's 80th birthday. And I want to, since I am not with him to celebrate, I want it on tape that, uh, Mac, I wish you a happy birthday. And I love you above all in my life. He's such a great guy. So happy birthday, Mac B. <clears throat> uh, I wasn't always, uh, I wasn't always a very considerate person. And today it feels good to do things that, uh, that Embrace the welfare and uh, of other people. I that's very important to me. And over a long period of time, that's the transformation that has taken place inside of me. Me, who was most interested in me always. And at any given moment, when spiritually I'm disconnected, I return to that place again. However, I want to give you a little uh, before I get into all that's taken place with me. I want to give you a little background about. Where I come from, uh, I don't come from an alcoholic family. I'm the oldest of three children born into an Irish Catholic family. And uh, we were people living in the same house under the same roof, but we all lived individual lives. We all had a job to do, and we were told early on exactly what our job was supposed to be. And mine was to go to school, get good grades, set a goal for myself, and attain that goal. And uh, I didn't pay much attention uh, to any of that. I Even back when I was a kid, I just thought that doesn't sound fun to me. But, of course, I didn't give that voice to my folks. But my younger brothers, I have two, uh, both of them heard that and embraced that and moved ahead, set goals for themselves. And they're fine uh, men today, raised families, and uh, they've gone to work and been self-supporting. And then there was me. And I wanted a free ride from the gate. I was given a good education, a good private education. My dad worked every day, worked hard every day to supply me with that education. And I just believed that that's what he was supposed to do. And uh, and I didn't really have any sense of appreciation when I was going to school. However, these days, I'm very grateful for the education I got. I was taught by the Dominican nuns. Uh, and of course, along with the Dominican nuns comes rules and regulations. And, uh, about this time, I, I can remember 
equating that with God. Somehow they spoke of God, and then they followed that up with the cooperation that was needed uh, in following the rules as they were laid out. And I heard all that. But there was just a missing piece inside of me. In fact, a bunch of missing pieces. And I just could not uh, put all that together. When I was a kid, I had a sweet and simple concept of the God of, of my understanding. I was the kind of kid that used to walk on fences, uh, climb trees. I used to be the kid that was walking on top of somebody's garage roof. Um, you know, and I used to lay uh, on the, my uh, swing set and I'd pretend that I was in the circus and I'd look up into the sky and I'd talk to God. The sky back then in California was blue, the clouds were white, and it was just a sweet, simple concept of a kid that talked to God and God lived up in heaven and where it was blue and white and, and peaceful. And then when I started going through school, I they followed all that up with rules and regulations. And so I fell away from this sweet, simple concept of a loving God. And uh, I had, I went to uh, private school, like I said. I went, uh, I graduated from high school only by the grace of God, who was not recognized in my life at this time. But God's never, ever been very far from me. I believe it was Thomas yesterday, or some, one of the bar speakers, that said, you know, that we were the ones that moved. And truthfully, I identify with that. You know, God was always very close, uh, in close proximity to me. So I um, uh, gradu- graduated from uh, high school, like I said, and it wasn't without my mother and dad's help. They had to put me back in several times before graduation and promised that I would behave. Um, and when I graduated, I went to this junior college in this little town where I lived, I went there for only one reason, and that was to find a husband. Um, That, uh, you know, that wasn't on the list of courses that were available, but inside my mind, it it was there. And I found him in Spanish class. Never have I done so well in a language class, because he did well. And you would have thought that somewhere along the line, I would be picking up some of my patterns, but uh, I did not. I just, I liked what this guy looked like. He was tall. My mother always said, uh, marry a tall guy. I don't know why, but uh, she did. She said, always make sure that they have a job in a car. And this this guy seemed to be employable. And he had a really fine looking car. I checked out the car. And of course, he'd finish his class, his, his uh, language class and go down to campus center. And I would immediately uh, finish my test because I made an invest, an emotional investment in him. He did not know this at the time, but he was my choice. Lucky guy. And, um, and we eventually met, had a brief conversation, and the next thing that I remember is that we were, we had gotten married. And, uh, we were moving, we moved south, we, this little valley town just wasn't, uh, moving fast enough as far as I was concerned, and I wanted to go to Los Angeles, and that's where we moved. And you know, when I came to Al-Anon, uh, I profess not to know anything about control. And you'll hear all through this, you know, that I knew, not only did I know a lot about control, but I also was well practiced at running the show. You know, uh, nothing happened by accident in my life. I was, I had a hand in everything. And uh, so we went to Los Angeles and uh, he went to school to further his education and I went to work. And I was having moments of clarity even back then. And I thought, this is not the way that it's supposed to be. He is supposed to be working and taking care of me. So my solution for this was I just quit my job. And I went home and told him that uh, he needed to get a job. And he's a nice guy, raised in a nice family. And he followed my lead and he quit school and went to work. Uh, a lot of things happened uh, in our in our uh, marriage. Uh, we had two children. Uh, God delivered two perfectly beautiful children to my husband and I. My husband at this time was not staying home. I I was uh, I was not totally present. I had really never ever been totally present in ever, any situation. And uh, he it wasn't comfortable in our home, and he he belonged to clubs, business clubs, etc. And he was away from the house a lot. And so the first baby arrived, and I was totally emotionally, spiritually ill-equipped to receive this priceless gift 
of this baby. I didn't know what to do with her. She scared the responsibility. It was awesome. It scared me to death. And back then we had play pens, and I had a play pen, and I just put her in the pen. I didn't know what else to do with this precious child. And then she started moving around. And I thought, you know, I, what do you do? And, of course, I was not neighborly. I didn't talk to anybody. I, uh, and so I thought, well, the solution to this is to get her a playmate. And so the insanity is very clear for everyone in the room to see, I'm sure. I compounded a situation uh, by having another baby. And uh, now I had two perfect little girls. And my husband and I am going more crazy all the time. And I, I was taking his staying away from home quite personally. And I, I didn't know how else, I didn't know how else to, to behave. I thought that he was out there having a good time. And I was home here stuck with these children. And uh, so I uh, didn't always stay at home with my children. Sometimes I put them in the care of somebody else. And other times I just left them. I'm not proud of the things that I have come to share with you today. However, I hope that overall you see how personally free uh, one gets as a result of working the 12 steps. There is no situation in your life that is too great to be overcome, to be overcome by the power of the steps. And I'm free here today. My life is an open book. But I always like to say that I'm not proud of the things as I hear myself say them. Uh, so I, uh, uh, we, my husband moved me around and eventually I found myself in a situation where, uh, I was having an affair with my next door neighbor. And, um, I would leave the children and leave my husband asleep on the couch and I would go next door and have an affair. Uh, I just needed love. I was chasing love and the, the interesting thing about that is that I could never have been loved enough. The problem was is that I couldn't feel love. Already I was making choices that built a wall so thick that there was no way that love from anyone uh, could ever uh, get through that get through that wall. Uh, this marriage obviously uh, ended uh, uh, ended in divorce and. Uh, I found myself, uh, as a result of this affair with my neighbor, the state of California uh, took my children away from me. Now, this added to a list of not feeling, not feeling loved in my family. Uh, as, the old, as the oldest in the family, being asked to do a lot of things that I believed my mother should be doing. And uh, I was beginning to build my story here as I moved along. So the state of California, gratefully, I say today, stepped in and took these two precious children away from me before I could do any further damage to them. And this was at a time when only uh, mothers that suffered from the disease of alcoholism were losing their children. And I can remember when I sat with my sponsor and uh, uh, was doing my fifth step, I thought, you know, um, th where is the good? What will be the good out of this? out of this incomprehensible uh, situation. And she said, you'll never know. You'll never know, but there may be somewhere in your recovery where you'll be in a meeting someday, and intuitively you will feel, not necessarily what you're hearing being said from someone across the room, but intuitively you will feel that this experience needs to be shared with someone. And that, that did happen to me, and it has happened to me since then as well. So never believe that the most horrible thing, the most horrible experience that you have had won't be of further good use. God just moves us right around so that all of that is used as we, uh, as we surrender to his grace. Um, so I didn't have, I lost custody of these children and I, my mother and dad wanted, well my mother actually wanted me to come north and live with her and I insisted upon staying in Los Angeles. And uh, I found myself in an apartment house, um, hiding behind the draperies. I had taken mother, uh, money from my mother and father with no intention of paying it back. Uh, they knew, they should know how much I need this money, and they shouldn't be asking for any repayment. That's the way I thought back then. Uh, I also took money from friends uh, to keep myself. I was terrified every day. Um, and it was in this apartment house that I was going to meet um, the second man in my life. And, you know, the common denominator here is me. I took me everywhere that I went. And uh, so obviously I was engaging the same thought process, and here I went again. 
I met this um, man in the um, on the way to the trash bin, actually, in this apartment house. And uh, I only went out after dark. I had no desire for the light to shine on me at all. I didn't want to see anybody. I had nothing to say to you. I wasn't interested in anything that you might want to say to me. So I only went out after dark, and I was dropping my garbage this night, and this guy comes up and starts talking to me. And it was as if none of the previous experiences that I just talked to you about had ever happened to me. I just went into the into the flirt mode, and before you know it, he's invited me to a little barbecue in, in this apartment complex where we lived, and uh, I found out some important information at this barbecue. He was a graduate of Southern Illinois University, and he was a psychology major, and uh, just seemed like this was a gift from God. Ab- absolutely, I needed help. I wasn't telling him that I needed help. But God was at play here, and he had sent me, he sent me this guy. And uh, so we, uh, uh, we uh, dated for a little while uh, in this apartment house. It was very cute, because I always stopped with the looks. You know, I was never interested in looking further than that. Shame on me, because it always ended up the same that way. But he was, uh, he was American Indian, and so obviously his skin color was beautiful. He wore white swim trunks, and uh, he'd carry a little... Uh, He'd carry a little uh, cooler down to the pool in the apartment complex. I'd peek out my curtains, and I could see him down there. And some days he'd pull out some beer. Other days he'd pull out, uh, you know, a shaker, and he'd make himself drink. And uh, I was just fascinated with that. I just thought that was, that was the coolest thing I'd ever seen in my life. You would have thought that a red flag would have gone up and said, you know, I wonder when this guy works. Well, that thought didn't even cross my mind. (laughs) And uh, so so we dated for a while, and then the next thing I know, I'm in Las Vegas, and I'm getting married again. And uh, so, you know, for anybody that has chased an alcoholic, you'll possibly identify with some of this story. It was one of the casinos downtown. The Strip, it was so long ago, the Strip wasn't even hardly there. But uh, there was a mezzanine in this casino, and a couple of days a week of Justice of the Peace would show up and marry people. So you'd get into line, and you'd wait for your turn. And so I want to tell you a little bit about my outfit, because it's important for me. It won't mean anything to you. Uh, but it's important that I, uh, that I realize that the story that I'm telling is about me. Uh, so... Uh, I knew how I felt on the inside, and I had lost tons of respect. You know, we don't always in Al-Anon talk about um, the price that we pay uh, to get here to Al-Anon, and, and in my belief, we earn our way here. Uh, just like members of AA, we earn our way to Al-Anon, and I had given away my self-respect a piece at a time during all these previous incidences, and so here I was at this casino, and uh, this guy, I was dressed in purple. I would have worn black, but I knew that that wouldn't be very appropriate for a wedding. So I thought dark purple. That's as close as I can get because that reflected how I felt about myself inside. And then I wore a pink hat, and I had mesh hose on and boots. I mean, I was a sight. And uh, so I was up in line, and I was talking to this girl, and I turned around making some reference to my fiancé, and he was gone. Now, anybody that that has chased an alcoholic, only we would know the fear that wells up inside when they get away. (laughs) It, It is... It is awesome fear. And so I asked this girl to hold my place in line because I was still intending upon getting married that day. And I went down, down into the casino and went to the bar and I found him. You know, in California, we had the pleasure of of hearing Winnie Eddie. And there may be some in the room that know dear Winnie. And Winnie always used to say, you know, uh, Lloyd John, they've both passed now. God bless their souls. But... She'd always say, Lloyd John could never hide from me. I would just put my head into the wind, and I'd always find him. And the very first time I heard her share her story, I thought, well, I identify with that. I'd never lost one either. They got away, but they never, I, I never lost one. So, so I was at the bar, and I found him. I said, what are you doing? And he said, well, I'm having a drink. And I said, well, I can see that. But why are you having a drink? And he said, well, I'm getting married today. 
And that seemed like enough of a good answer to me. So I stood there while he finished his drink. And then I took him by his arm and I drug him back up to the mezzanine. And, uh, and we got married. We came home. And the other story that I just want to say about our relationship, because it's an important story, uh, is that he was a salesman on the road a lot. And uh, so he called me one night in the middle of the night. And I had gone to work by this time. I was uh, thought that I probably needed some distraction, so I'd go to work. And, um, uh, and he called me and he said, uh, Kay, uh, I'm in trouble. And I said, well, what in the world's wrong? Well, he was up the central coast, and he said I was having dinner with my clients, and I went to the bar. And the next thing I know, somebody just grabbed me by the front of my shirt and just beat the hell out of me. I said, you have got to be kidding. <laughs> Who would treat you so mean? And he said, I don't know. I didn't, you know, I didn't get a name. But, <clears throat> <laughs> but I need you. Well, I mean, when we hear those words, are we lit up or what? I mean, I need you. So uh, so out of bed I got, into my car, and up the coast I went. Found the dinner house, found him. We found the car. And really the only thing that I know today for sure, and I've thrown out a lot of words at this point, and you'll have a few more before I'm done. However, the only real thing that I know is, is that when you find the alcoholic, that you never let them follow you home. Never let them remain back there because they have a habit of veering off <laughs> and uh, so I put him in my headlights that's the only thing just always keep them in front of you where you can see them that's the only thing I know for sure and um, <clears throat> and down the coast we came and I had another moment of clarity and this moment of clarity was that I what was I what was I doing up in the middle of the night I was working he could sleep in the next day and, uh, but, oh, I immediately dismissed that because a good wife, a good friend, you know, anybody with any integrity would get up and help somebody else, would help their husband. And I needed to see myself that way. So up I went and uh, found him, came home. And the other important thing I want to tell you about this, about this marriage was that night he said to me, and I think sometimes in recovery even, we're a little quick to dismiss the words of an alcoholic, especially a drinking alcoholic. You know, I, I, I bathed him that night, put him in his pajamas, put him to bed, took good care of him, and uh, he said he thanked me. And I think sometimes we dismiss a thank you from a sick alcoholic. And I want to be very cautious these days. I understand that we're up against a disease, a disease over which we have no power to control. And once the, the alcoholic takes a drink, he needs to take or she needs to take another drink. And they need to drink until they get done. It is their medicine. And, uh, so, but that doesn't make them bad. You know, it was a, it was a huge awareness when I finally realized that alcoholism is not bad. This is an illness that we're up against here. And so Jerry that night said to me, you know, thank you, Kay. And he said, you know, I I didn't mean I didn't mean to cause I didn't mean to cause all this trouble. And I heard him say that. And I have never forgotten that. And when I come to the podium I try to remember to say that. Out it's uh, just an ongoing living amend to a man that I haven't seen now in a long, long time. But somewhere along the line, I want to be on record that uh, I didn't dismiss a sick alcoholic's comments that night. That marriage ended up... Uh... Thank you, I was hunting my lunch. Um, the, um, that, and that night, that marriage didn't end up... Oh, I can't even see that. What time is that? Now that I found it, I can't even see it. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, that, ended, that marriage uh, um, was soon to end. However, before it ended, uh, I decided that what I probably really needed, and I was probably grown up enough and now to have another baby. So, you know, this is, the, this is the manufactured misery. I don't know how else to classify that. You know, except that as I compound a willful, a willful nature, I have manufactured additional misery for myself. 
And so here comes this idea again that this that a baby will fix a situation, an alcoholic situation. Um, I, we moved into a home, and uh, neighbors had a little party for us, and uh, we went to this party this night. He promised to behave. I believed him. And uh, the first thing that I saw was everybody was jumping up off the couch, and he dropped a cigarette, and uh, we were all smoking back then. Everybody smoked. I loved to smoke. It was great. And uh, nothing about it that I didn't like. However, I don't smoke today, and I'm glad because there's so many rules and regulations about it. You know, you got to go over here to do it, and... And sometimes I don't mind very well, even today. So God has just removed all that pressure from me. And um, But back then, we smoked. So we dropped a cigarette, and I was terribly embarrassed, and I gave him, you know, the sign to come in the hallway and talk with me. And uh, he did. He followed. And, you know, he was at a point that night that his eyes weren't looking the same direction. Now, I don't know if you've ever been with an alcoholic... You know, when one eye kind of drops off, and, and it's very hard to get their attention, you know. Uh, but I wanted him to pay attention to me. And I said, will you please just, you know, just be careful and just don't embarrass us. Oh, and he promised in the hallway. The next thing I know, we're at the dinner table, and he has reached across the table and has spilled a drink. Now we've got now we've got the drink running down the tablecloth, and everyone's trying to gather it up, and it's you know it's in a lady's lap, and now you know, and we're the new we're the new folks in town. I I mean it was just horrible, and uh, so I went to the kitchen and was talking to the hostess of the party, and she said, uh, you know, she wanted to know where we came from and what what was going on, and I said, well, the really important news is that um, we're going to have a baby. I'm going to have a baby. And as I said that, my my husband stumbled through the kitchen. Now, after this party, the interesting thing about this is that we had a very meaningful conversation over the hood of the car out in front of the uh, house, and uh, and I was stone cold sober, and uh, and my husband was drunk, and he said, you know, I I thought I heard something about a baby in there that you said, and I said, oh. And he said, yeah, he says, and I just want to tell you, I don't want the responsibility of a child. I'm not ready to start a family. And, of course, I stood there saying nothing, knowing full well that in sooner or later I was going to have to fess up and tell him that I was already pregnant. I'd already set the wheels in motion. And yet here I am, somebody that doesn't know about running the show and controlling. So God delivered another wonderful, sweet child to uh to us um about this time i uh i thought that i was going to have a nervous breakdown uh and so i decided that uh i was going to go to a um uh, adult education and i was going to uh check into some classes and i was going to be taught how to uh tie uh, macrame and paint plaster of paris i thought this was um these would be easy classes and um and I got very good at macrame. And so if you lived in my neighborhood, you got a macrame hanging, whether you asked for it or not. And I was referred to as a lady that was a little, people just weren't quite sure about me. And I would go out in the neighborhood and I'd knock on your door and I'd hand you a hanging. And, uh, and you know, and most people took them. Uh, some were for your potted plant on your patio, and then others were uh, for your door inside. Or some, I did beads as well. Sometimes I gave them to you to hang in your bathroom. Uh, so there were all different kinds, and I got quite good. And I was tying knots and smoking cigarettes. Um, and uh, it was just... <laughs> I, there, I, there wasn't a whole lot of worth in my life, but I was busy. I was keeping busy. And the real important thing about this is that I met the girl that was going to bring me to Al-Anon. And uh, she was drunk the day that I met her. And we um, went into the school, and we were looking for our classrooms to go. And uh, she couldn't find hers. I couldn't find mine and that day. And she asked me to go uh, have lunch with her. And so I thought that that was kind of nice. So I went with her and we sat in the back of this dinner house. We went to the back where it was dark and cool. I'd never been back there. But since then, I know that there's a lot of people that are very familiar with the dark, cool back part of a bar. And uh, we sat back there and she ordered drinks and told me about her life and she cried. And then she said something to me that just terrified me. And uh, she said, now, uh, what about your life? What about you? And that was 
a just a terrifying, hard question. I didn't know how to answer that question. I'd been everything. I tried. I tried everything. I was a. I was trouble walking. I was a miserable success. Uh, in my life, I'd have periods of success, and then I'd have, you know, so it was up and down for me. And I didn't know how to answer that question, so I made I made up a story. And it must have been a good one, because she cried, and I cried too. And, <laughs> you know, I wanted to match her in stories. So we went back to this class for a while, and then uh, she quit coming, and so did I. And I was not to meet Judy again until one night in a grocery store. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about how I looked, because it's important. It's part of the victimization that sets in for any good member of Al-Anon. It's when you, uh, you're, nothing is going your way. You know, I would stand at the window holding this baby, waiting for the car to come home. And then when he would come home, I'd rush the baby over, drop her in her crib, and run and get into bed and pretend I was asleep. And I did that over and over and over again. I didn't know whether to love him, whether to hate him. I had ceased doing anything in the house. Uh, however, I wanted to leave evidence that I had done something. So I would cook meals, and uh, I would serve the table. There was no one sitting at the table, but I would serve the meal to the table. And, uh, and I would not eat because I wasn't hungry. I weighed about 85 pounds. I stand about five seven and a half. My hair was very long. I'd ceased to uh, to bathe, take care of myself. It didn't seem important. I wasn't going anywhere. Nobody was talking to me. I wasn't talking to anybody either. And uh, so I would I wasn't eating the dinner that I would prepare either. But I would push the plates when he didn't come home. I would push the plates in the center of the table and leave the food dried on the plate because that was the evidence that he needed to see when he came home. But I was keeping up my half of the bargain, and it seemed to provide me with a lot of of angry fuel uh, while I was there alone, waiting for the alcoholic to come home. I'd cease doing laundry. You know, I couldn't have done a little laundry if I wanted to. Neither could I have gone into the living room, sat down on the couch or any of the chairs, because I had thrown laundry that needed to be folded in there. And it, that was all mixed in with his drinks, his, the, his beer cans, his everything that he left all over. If he wasn't picking up after himself, I saw no reason for me to pick up after him either. And this is the this is the terrible dual decline that happens when you love an alcoholic. Um, so, um, so Judy and I uh, I met Judy this night in this grocery store, and I had run over there barefoot, and uh, and she started to talk to me, and it was like I heard you know just like white noise. I I saw her mouth moving. I I couldn't understand what she was saying. I didn't want her looking at me. I didn't know. I just was terrified. And but I did hear her say one thing and she said, you know, I'll come by and visit you and I just tried to get away from her as quick as I could. I went home. Now what I didn't know about Judy is that Judy had been gifted with sobriety since I had seen her last. She was now a sober member of AA. And I can't say that I haven't been treated in the most special way from the gate. From the gate. Uh because Judy didn't forget me. She re- she knew that there was a troubled person out there. And she made a choice to come back and try and find me and bring me to the same place where so much hope already was being offered to her. I mean, you can't get an invitation full of more selfless generosity than that, and she was newly sober. So, you know, to the women in AA, my hat was off then, and it remains off today to you. I owe you so much so much from the beginning. So uh, Judy uh, uh, took me to this, uh, came to my home this night, and of course now immediately I wanted to pick up and tidy up. And she just didn't pay any attention to any of that. She said, come on, get in the car. I got in the car. She took me to this dumpy little place. I mean, I I couldn't believe it. We parked across the street. And of course it was the 502 Club, the Alano Club in Covina, California. And uh, I was about to embark on a journey that I had not clue one what it was going to be like for me. It was going to be a process, the 12 steps of recovery that was going to save my very life. But listen to the initial approach. I got out of the car and I said to her, this place is awfully small. <laughs> and she said, um, uh, well, it's, you know, it's good enough 
It's a good size. There's a lot of people in there. And I said, oh, okay. We got closer. There was a curtain hanging off the rod in the front. And I said, well, nobody in there is paying attention to business. They need to, they need to repair that curtain up there. And, you know, I just told you what my home looked like. And, uh, and then as I got close, I said, oh, and look at the window. It's very dirty. It's, don't they clean in here? And Judy just kept walking. But the miracle had already happened because I was following. I was following her. The door opened, in she walked. You know, there was a cloud of smoke for any of you that been around for a while. You remember what the Alano clubs were like when we were smoking. Nobody in there was drinking, but we were all smoking. And uh, there was a lot of activity at the pool table, and all of a sudden I thought, oh, maybe this, you know, isn't so bad. And uh, everybody was talking at once. Nobody was listening. It was just great. I loved it. And uh, so when I went, and I wanted to kind of hang in the front and kind of look around, and, and she said, no, we're going all the way into this room. And she took me to my very first meeting of Al-Anon. Judy passed away. Uh, she celebrated uh, right soon after her 25th sober birthday. And I was with Judy. And, you know, God sent me such a special person. And I hope you have a special person in your life. She was my greatest sideline rooter. She always said, you know, okay, just keep, just keep going to Al-Anon. Um, it's, it's going to help you. And she was always, she shared in the delight and, uh, and the joy as she saw me emerging with a person that was now uh, being given uh, some direction in her life, that was slowly finding a place where she fit a purpose for her life, for her very being. And she was thrilled about that. And uh, so I always... I always want to be on record as far as Judy was concerned. She was specially delivered to me by a loving God. And I hope I make her proud as I continue my recovery. What's happened to me um, in uh, all these years of Al-Anon? Well, I went in this meeting, and, of course, everybody in there was about my age today. I thought, gee, I need to ask the question, you know, where do the young people go? I was 36 years old, and uh, I said, you know, this The pace here is a little slow for me. And, um, you know, and they they give you that thick, sweet smile, you know. And they say, oh, don't worry about that. You know, just we're really glad to meet you. And we hope to see you in another meeting soon. And I thought, oh, you know, not, you know. Well, you know, today I I have a home group. I go to meetings. I am sponsored. I work the steps. And I'm of maximum service to my fellowship. That's, that's what works for me. And I know by evidence of all of you in this room this morning that obviously that works for you as well. Uh, it was in this meeting that I found my first sponsor. Um, basically, I want to tell you quickly because there's so much to tell that's happened that's just miraculous. Um, but I uh, came into a meeting one night and she was sitting next to me and every, some people said I'd been away. I had taken a little R&R. I'd been around the meeting uh, meetings for about a year, and then I got kind of tired. Uh, obviously, I had done the, followed um, my idea on what would be the important action to take. I wasn't talking to anybody, but I thought, well, these steps, and they were in framed pictures all along the wall in my meeting room. I thought, well, that's got to be a key. So I will memorize all of these, and then there'll be somebody that'll come up and ask me to recite, and uh, and then I'll get a, a good grade, and... Uh, That was the best I could do. And after a year, putting in a year here with all of these older folks, nobody came up and asked me to recite. And so I thought, well, I've got to go, I got to go out and stir up, stir up something. So I did. But when I came back, I went to this meeting this night and this gal sitting next to me asked me how I was. And I said, oh, I'm just fine. I was always fine. You know, there might have just been a, a, a small disconnect now and then. But overall, I was fine. And uh, she said to me, you are a liar. And I couldn't believe that she had slandered me in this meeting. I just, that was just beyond me. And my, I remained in the meeting, but the rest of the meeting I was thinking, well, she's rude. I mean, after this meeting, I'm going to, I'm just going to call her on how rude she was. Well, I didn't get a chance because uh, as the meeting progressed, Something was said, and, and something happened to me that I swore would never happen to me. I had seen it in the previous year that I'd attended meetings. I saw people lose emotional control. I saw them start to cry. And I'm smart enough to know, uh-uh, 
You do not lose emotional control. You are in control at all costs because the minute that you let your guard down, they're going to get a hold of you. And then all is, if the jig is up then, you know, so don't cry. Oh, my God. Well, I lost at this time and began to cry. And I know today that crying cleanses our soul. It's a wonderful, it's a gift to be able to cry. And yet this night, that's what happened to me. So obviously that was one of my first initial surrenders as far as uh, being in a meeting. And, of course, uh, coming to the meeting uh, was the biggest and most grand surrender that I that I could make. So I asked this woman to be the special friend. I didn't use the word sponsor. I didn't quite understand that. I thought that that probably involved money. So I wanted to be cautious there. And uh, I thought, well, just be a fr- you know, just be a special friend to me. And she said, however you want it. I mean, you know, she just let me have my way that night. However, she had her way uh, from uh, the next day on. And uh, you know, I'm very grateful. She didn't uh, she didn't show a whole lot of compassion. In fact, um, on the contrary, she was really aggressive, cold, and insensitive. Uh, in fact, I didn't like her uh, after I asked her to be this special friend. She didn't hesitate to tell me that uh, when I wanted to talk about things that she was not interested in my opinion. And, uh, you know, so it started out with being called a liar, and then it was, it was downhill from there. <laughs> and she said, you know, you are here, we are going to, uh, we're going to get into the steps, and you're going to learn to commit, you're going to learn to come to meetings. I mean, she was writing the agenda for me, and I thought, you know, I am from a good family, and I am well-educated, and she just wasn't the least impressed with any of that. She would come back and say things like, you know, and you are here because of your own ideas, and uh, and then that would stop me for a minute, and I'd have to think about that. It always seemed that, you know, she had this way of, you know, that kind of that cutesy uh, one-liner stuff, you know, you'd ask the question and then she'd come back at you with, you know, a one-liner that just took your breath away for a minute and you had to recoup and that happened to me a lot. She said, I want you to go to meetings and I said, you know, how long do I have to go to these meetings? And she said, you go to these meetings until you want to go to meetings. I thought, fat chance, you know, I mean, I... I was not planning on staying here. Now, my uh, my date, I came, I was brought by Judy to Al-Anon in February of 1975. And like so many from the podium say, you know, I'll do the math for you so you can stay with me. Uh, that's 33 years. And I wasn't planning on staying here 30 minutes. The problem was not mine. The problem was outside of me. If people would only mind what I you know, mind what I ask them to do. Do what I, I'm telling you to do. And uh, allow me to help you. And uh, you'll, live a, you'll live a good life. And I just, that didn't seem like a complex idea to me. But nobody was, was getting it. And uh, so here I am in al And she's saying, you go to meetings. And I said, well, you know, do you go to this? She'd say, I want you to go to step study meeting. And I said, well, I'll see you there. And she says, no. Uh, I'm, I don't go to that meeting, uh, or I'm not going to that meeting this week. And I thought to myself, well, Ben, you just gave me too much information that I don't have to go either. And then immediately she would say, but I have lots of friends that go to that meeting. <laughs> and I'd say to myself, you know, how did, how, how did she know that that's what I was thinking? So I was, I was attracted by what you knew based upon your experience and terrified at the same time. You know, she's, uh, so uh, obviously now I am, I am faced with working the steps. She told me that step one, that obviously uh, it had to be worked 100%, that there was no uh, conditional working of step one, that I was powerless, that what I was up against was a disease, a disease called alcoholism, and my own personal uh, severe living problems in reacting to something that I didn't know anything at all about. But truthfully, I earned my way here, and I earned my way through my own problems. I got down to finding an alcoholic attractive. You know, uh, that's the way it happened for me. And so she said, you have to work that step uh, 100%. That, uh, you know, that my, uh, that my willfulness, exerting my willfulness over my life, that my self-will could not overcome my self-will. And that in step two, that a power greater than ourselves, could overcome my self-will. 
And she, she, we worked out of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, we, a lot of uh, Al-Anons, as old as I am and older, uh, were introduced to the big book. We didn't have, you know, a lot of literature back then. And uh, so my column inventory, everything was introduced to me through the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm so grateful for that today. But in the second step where we come to believe, uh, I was told that believing is a spiritual principle. Uh, and I did not, I did not know that. I knew that I had a lot of broken dreams, that I wanted to believe that things were going to be okay. I wanted to believe in you. I wanted to believe in myself. But as I exercised my will over things, I kept slipping away, further and further away from belief that any of this could be, could be rectified. Um, uh, obviously the, I didn't have a problem with the, the sanity. I knew that choices that I had made uh, I had paid some terrible consequences, and uh, I'd embarrassed my family uh, when I was in the hospital, when I had gotten myself beat up so bad, when I had that affair with my neighbor. My family stood at the foot of the bed, and I will never forget this. And uh, I, I was joyful to see them. It was an, I was in an old-time oxygen tent. Um, the doctors were trying to save my life, and there was condensation on the inside, and I could only see my family. You know, they were just down at the foot of my bed, but there was fear in their eyes, and I never want to forget that. That was me in that bed, and that was my family looking at me. They had not raised me to make choices and have things happen to me that were happening to me back then. And uh, so, uh, you know, I knew that I had taken myself, you know, and the alcoholic uh, uh, wasn't even involved, truthfully, yet then. Uh, those were consequences of my own living problems. And, um, <clears throat> you know, step three, I love step three. And step three is about making a decision, obviously, to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understand God. Um, the decision in this, in, in this step is that God is going to direct my life. He's going to direct my life. My sponsor told me so. She said, you've done a dismal job at that. God is going to direct your life. My decision in the third step is to allow that to happen and immediately follow it up with the action of the fourth step. You know, sometimes I believe, if you're like me, that you kind of get the idea that after you've done some, some, hard, some you know, uh, good work, some good uh, step work, that you get a little time off. You know, that you, get, you're, uh, you ought to be able to have a little R&R. And think about what you've done. And uh, I was told that that's not the case. There's no R&R around here for UK. You know, take a little vacation and then I'll see you in a couple of weeks. No, you continue to come to meetings. You continue to do this. So here I am at the third step and I'm making this decision. I was not excited about what, uh, how the fourth step uh, read and what I heard in meetings. In fact, I thought, you know, if you're smart, you never put anything down in writing. I mean, you never, you never sign your name to anything, and you don't put it down in writing. And I thought, this will not happen. So I tried to convince my sponsor, I'll do a, I'll do a one-on-one, -on -one. I'll tell you this stuff. And thank God, you know, she wasn't buying anything from me. I mean, she saw to the very center of my soul, somebody that was crying out for help, and yet the best defense between having to finally admit that you don't know how to do it, You've never known how to do it, uh, that there's a long way between that. And thank God that people have that ability to look to the very center, to find, uh, to see the fear that exists in there and the, and the, uh, uh, the hesitancy to expose. I, I thought that if I let you really know who I was and what I was all about, uh, then you'd have to ask me to leave because that's what I would have done with me. You know, there's no spiritual generosity as we're being led through the steps. A person like me does not know that I'm going to be treated gentle, that I'm going to be given unconditional love, that someone's going to take my hand, that someone's going to save me a seat uh, and ask me to go with them somewhere. You know, I didn't know about any of that. So my hesitancy in working the steps and my defiance, I was terribly defiant as well. I was ruled by panic and fear. And so to surrender to this inventory where I was expected 
to put down things that really happened in my life, to put down the truth as I understood the truth then, my first inventory, was just, I just thought, I just can't do this. And my sponsor said, oh, yes, you can, and yes, you will. More of that insensitive hard talk, you know, and she was not letting up on this. And thank goodness, thank goodness, had there been anybody else, that might have gone for my baloney, you would have a different speaker here today. Totally. So uh, we got into the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and she added a column after, um, uh, you know, the uh, fourth column as it's laid out in the book. And her, her added column was, where have you placed yourself in a position to be hurt? It was necessary for this Al-Anon to see that I had had high expectations. Expectations had driven me to make choices and find myself in situations expecting you to behave different, expecting you to do it for me, expecting you to be better at what you do. And uh, and it was important that she add that. And I'm so grateful uh, to her for, uh, for how she handled me in the beginning. Step five, uh, admitted to, my, or let's see, step five, admitted God to ourselves and to another human being. Well, obviously, uh, in the beginning, I could not be trusted. My perspective was so off point that, um, that I, I went straight to God through my sponsor. My sponsor was an invaluable help here. Uh, you know, she was the one that encouraged me to put my name on the, my amends list as well. You know, I needed help, and I needed someone at my elbow every moment to help me through the steps. And she was so gracious in, na- in nature and, uh, and so unconditionally loving that she never left me alone for, for very long. So I, I know I owe so much to my, uh, to my first sponsor. Uh, six and seven companion steps work side by side by me. I'm a visual person, and step six is a readiness step. And I envision myself sweeping up my defects of character, putting it in a bag, getting it ready for disposal. Uh, And that's worked for me for years. And step seven, you know, the things, certainly the things that stand in my way of being useful to a loving God and my fellows. You know, the third step and seven step prayer have been part of my effective prayer for a long, long time. And once again, you know, I, I am a I am a proud member of Al Anon, but I want to be on record on the importance of the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous and how grateful I am that I was brought to AA and that I was led to a sponsor who uh, had been uh, studying out of the book in her own right and had that to pass on to me. These days we have some wonderful Al Anon literature, and I'm so glad that I've kept coming back. To welcome it, I, because our new blueprint for progress, our inventory workbook, I think is grand. Our first one was, our first one, I, I answered all the questions, yes, no, sometimes, and maybe. That was about as good as I could do back then, and I handed it in to my sponsor, and she immediately handed it back uh, to me and asked me to write more. But I... Uh, these days, uh, the uh, chapters in our new workbook, intimacy, finances, things that we as Al-Anon members need to take a look at. It's important that we are challenged to take a deeper look at the person that you go to bed with every night that you get up with every morning. You know, my recovery is my recovery. It has nothing at all to do with the alcoholic that I love, and I love my husband dearly. But I've accepted responsibility for my own actions, and I... I didn't stay anywhere where I wasn't um, getting something out of the party or wherever I happened to be, and that holds true today. I would not be here today if I wasn't excited about ongoing possibilities and the opportunities that I that I have here. You know, change takes place every day. You know, this afternoon is going to be different than this morning, and you can bank on that. And every one of a loving God's opportunities to me to be an expression of his grace and his love comes in an envelope and it has printed across the face of the envelope change. I've learned to embrace it so that I can open it, so that I can see the opportunity to do better, to be better. And I've had a, I've had a magnificent personal transformation and I owe it all to the Fellowship of Alan on AA and a loving God and all the people that made themselves available to me that stuck by me in the beginning. Um, made a list of all persons is, is eight, made direct amends is nine. 
Uh, my list was made right after my inventory, my amends, uh, and I'll just tell you uh, about a couple of them. I'll, my mother and my father. My mother, I didn't ever really particularly like my mother. I was in competition with my mother. I saw her go to her bedroom a lot, and, uh, and I was left in the care, with the responsibility of taking care of my brothers. And I didn't like, I didn't like what I saw there. And, uh, and I'm not proud of that. My mom is a, my mom's a great gal. She was wonderfully personable. She went to church and she had a, has a deep and abiding faith. But, uh, I, she didn't ever understand me. I mean, she didn't really raise me. So when I hit the streets, I, you know, I knew a lot about prayer rugs, candles, bells, all of that. And she never understood any of that. And, uh, you know, I'd come home and try to talk to her about it. And uh, she just she just couldn't get her mind around what I was doing and why I was doing it. And I always had a good idea. You know, our opening speaker on Thursday night, uh, I totally identified, you know, that willful thing. I, another idea. Oh, there comes another idea. Uh, if, if there was a cartoonist that would have drawn me, could have drawn me before I got here. I would have been, I would have been walking down a sidewalk with one of those bubbles over my head full of ideas. And when I needed a new idea, I just reached up there, grabbed that idea and played it forward, played it out. And uh, people used to say to me, including my parents, where did you get that idea? You know, why did you do that? And I would say to them, because I thought it was a good idea. And, uh, and I never had any, any, you know, uh, uh, satisfaction or closure or a comfortable conclusion based upon my ideas, ever. So, um, the amends to, uh, my mom, she was recuperating from a facelift, and I thought, you know, she won't be able to ask me any questions. And so I was going to step study, and I wanted to report back to the group that I had been paying attention, and that I knew that I owed her an amend. So I, I went, got in the car, drove to the town where she lived, went in, made my amends. Now I know today that, and I was instructed by my sponsor, an amends does not consist of saying I'm sorry. Like everybody in the room, I've said I'm sorry all my life, and it didn't ever, it didn't ever change a thing for me. But my sponsor told me, when you make amends, you go and you state the reason for which you have come. And, uh, and obviously I have always placed myself in a, in a, um, in a men's situation asking for forgiveness. And, uh, and, but with my mom, I wasn't quite there yet, so I wanted a good story to report back to the group. So I, uh, I guess I thought I was never going to talk to my mother ever again because she went, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. She did one of those because she couldn't talk because of her facelift. And uh, so I came back to the group and reported to the group. That night at the conclusion of the meeting, my sponsor and I had a meaningful conversation. And she said, you know, you've missed the point here. And, uh, you know, she never ever said that was a nice attempt, you know. I mean, she just said, you have missed the point. And uh, so here she comes at me again. And, uh, I mean, it was a full-time job trying to outwit her, outsmart her. I, you know, I mean, it was enough that I was going to learn to do things differently. But, I mean, with this woman, I was trying to get a handle on her, and I was having a hard time. So here comes the, uh, the amends to my dad, and, and uh, this time I did consult with my sponsor, and I, I went to my dad, and, and we talked about forgiveness, and we talked about love, and I told him, honestly, that I, I just didn't believe that he loved me. I, and I tried to be generous enough to help him realize that I tried to understand how much he loved his sons. But that I had changed everything in my life to be like him. I'd gotten into the same business, the same career as him, uh, and I just wanted his approval so bad and, uh, and his love so desperately. And he said, you know, I can't imagine, Kay, I've always loved you. Right out of my dad's mouth. He said, I have always loved you. And I realized then that I was the one that was incapable of feeling the love that uh, I needed to do ongoing, continuing inventory work so that I could remove the things that blocked me from God, that that was the only way that it was going to happen for me so that I could feel the love from uh, from my folks and you and, and that I could learn to love myself. Uh, so the, uh, the amends were made. And, of course, after the step work between the steps four and step nine, I now was beginning to see things differently. I was now beginning to risk acting differently. 
And uh, I was now even having glimpses of intuitively knowing when to keep my mouth shut, uh, you know, how to, how to act a little, in a little more of an appropriate manner. So I was beginning to live out the promises. Step 10, uh, obviously, today, I'm only a thought away from a spiritual disconnect. And those can even be on days when I have made time for my higher power, where I have uh, sat down with my book, said my prayers, said my prayers with my husband, and I can get up and take a step and feel the disconnect. I can feel the mean-spiritedness arise in me. And I, on these days, when they happen to me, I try very hard not to overreact or overload myself either. I've learned to treat myself kindly. Uh, you have shown me how to do that. And, uh, and I just realized that today I just need to be cut a wide berth. And I give voice to that in my family and my friends. I readily admit that today I just don't feel quite on the beam. And nothing is taken away from me. That's not a fatal comment on my part. People do. They just cut me a wide berth. And, and, I'm, and I'm back on the beam eventually. But I'm only a thought away from an old idea. I know that. And uh, so that's why I go to meetings. That's why I'm of maximum service to my fellowship. Uh, that's why I am sponsored. Because I don't, always, I don't always see it. But even if I just begin to feel it, she's the very first one that I'm on the phone with. And uh, she sets me straight for that day. Now, this first sponsor, after 20 years, uh, she chose to take another direction in her life. And I found myself no longer sponsored. And I didn't know what to do. I was terrified. And uh, I knew that I needed to be sponsored. I needed to have someone out in front of me. However, this time, instead of being called a liar, I started looking around. And I started looking around for a woman that uh, that was active in Al-Anon, that was excited about being here in Al-Anon, excited about uh, opportunities that she had, that uh, whose uh, husband was sober, that she uh, obviously, in actions and attitudes, uh, supported sobriety, that she was a maximum service to her fellowship, uh, and that above all, that she was generous and loving in spirit. And I found her. She's my sponsor today, and she happens to be in Pittsburgh as we speak. And uh, she says to be um, send her love and hello to everyone. Um, and uh, and I asked her to say a prayer for me. Um, so uh, this gal, she uh, uh, she's everything that everything that I want to be. You know, when I was new, I had the pleasure of uh, meeting Lois and being in Lois's company. And I never thought that would happen. I didn't really think that it was going to be very important. And I look back on that today, pictures with little Lois. We went to her apartment. She'd come to Palm Springs to uh, speak at the Palm Springs Roundup. And, uh, and I, was, I got to go into her apartment. And she comes down the hall, and she's got a little blue velvet robe on. And, and uh, she kind of posed in the doorway. And we took her picture, and, and we talked with her. And so I've had the arms of Lois Wilson, our founder, uh, around me, and tell me that that isn't a, uh, a precious gift. Oh, I would have never, I would have never thought that I would have been so lucky. But I also was attending meetings with, El- with Elsa Chamberlain, and as I look over here and see Chuck's picture on the wall, I think, oh, I'm so overpaid. I can't tell you how overpaid I am, and thought to have none of this happen. I mean, this was just all all included in the unconditional love and support that was given me along the way. I did nothing but come to meetings. I just came to meetings. And uh, and Elsa, I can remember going to conferences like this one, and she'd be up in front, of course, because I was told that's where the winners sit. The winners sit up front. So those of you in the back, there's hope for you. Uh, next meeting, I'd like to see the back row up front. And... Um, uh, and she, I used to see her, and she was everything that I wanted to be. She was dignified and calm, and she had a wonderful laughter. And yesterday we sat out, my, uh, half a dozen of us were sitting out in the, um, uh, in the front of the hotel here and telling stories and sharing things. 
and we just filled up the area with laughter out there. And uh, I, I just, I remember Elsa doing that as well. And I patterned myself a lot after her today. And uh, I wanted everything that she had. And I'd run up to her, and she would enter. She'd say, "Oh, here comes another one of my girls." That was the greatest compliment that she could have given me back then. Was here comes one of my girls. Little did she know that she was everything that I wanted to be. So uh, I've had I've had quite a I've had quite a a, a life. I want to talk about the um, the importance of. Um, of step 11 prayer and meditation you know prayer is when I talk to God and my God these days is not a distant possibility he is an inner reality he is my inner resource and that is where I go to connect with God Uh, and meditation of course is thinking about and listening to God however in the world am I going to know what God asks of me if I don't give a higher power some of the most precious gift that I have to give and that's my time. I must never be too busy to pray. I must never be too busy to take time out to connect with my higher power. That's what this deal is all about. There is no human power that has any answer for any of us. But God has all of the answers. And the other important ingredient about step 11 for me is that it is a culmination of step 3. You know, when I made that decision, turning my will and my life over to the care of God, I now in step 11, in step 11, am receiving God's will. And in receiving God's will, it has changed the direction of my life. My life has been changed when this happens. This is the real deal for all of us in this room. Is this is a life-changing program that we are in. If you're members of Al-Anon, and obviously AA members know that it is life changing for us here. You know, I sometimes think why have I why was I chosen? Why why have why would I, of all people, be chosen? And don't you know that when this conference is over, this ballroom will return to be just a ballroom. The love and acceptance and joy that we feel here today, we bring with us. That's the power. That's the power. You never realize the power going into anything. But you always see the result of the power. You always see the result of the power. And also, down the street and around the corner, there are families that have no idea that we're here this weekend. No idea that they're so close to a solution. And that's the theme of our conference, is that there is a solution. Thank goodness. And the added good news, and I always want to be the bearer of added good news, is that we have access. We have access to the solution. If you're here this morning, get excited about what you're doing. Because if you're like me and you're not excited, then you'll leave. And then you take with you every opportunity for us to love you. We need one another to love. Without you, I have no one to love. I need you to love you. I'm the very best when I am with you. Step 12 is all about faith, and uh, it's a guarantee, it's a promise. And, uh, you know, the message in the 12th step is that steps work. If they'll work for somebody like me, they will definitely work for someone like you. I want to tell you a little bit about uh, what's happened with my mama and also uh, with my husband. You know, I met Mac in an AA meeting, and I was there under sponsor direction, and uh, she said, uh, I said, why do I have to go to an AA meeting? I'm not, I'm not, I don't drink. And she said, you have to go there because I'm sick and tired of hearing you blame. You blamed everybody. The alcoholic is just easy to blame. I want you to go and hear their stories and hear them say that they didn't get up in the morning and start to drink and tear things up just to make your life uncomfortable. You weren't even on their mind. And... You know, so I followed her. I can't even tell you today why I cooperated, but thank God I did. So here I am sitting in the same meeting, and this fascinating guy comes into this meeting. And I always had an eye open for a fascinating guy. In fact, you know, there is a man running around here this morning that's in a tie-dye T-shirt. And I, if, if anybody knows him, I want him to look closely at me. We may know one another. <laughs> I'm a product of the 50s and 60s, and I... I saw that shirt immediately out there and thought, well, anyway, um, 
So here comes my uh, here comes Mac into this meeting, and he glad hands all across the back of the meeting. And oh, I like the style of this guy. As soon as I saw him, and he's a center aisle kind of guy. Mac does not come to the front of a room to a side aisle. He'll take the center aisle in a room every time. Just the kind of guy that would catch my eye, and the kind of guy that that um, uh, that God knew that I would that I needed and that I could love and that would love me. Takes a special kind of a guy. That he because he has to disregard so much of <laughs> so much of me at times. Anyway, up the meeting he came and um I uh I said to my sponsor, Who's that guy? And she says, Well the question ought to be, who's that attractive blonde that is following him up the aisle <laughs> because they're dating. And I spent the rest of that meeting trying to figure out, had I said something to her that I don't remember, like was I worried about that? I was never worried about that. And so after the meeting, we went to this little place, um, this little restaurant, and I did my fastest three and a half minutes worth of flirting. And um, and it worked, and Mac invited his, my little girl and myself to come back down. He raised his family, and, uh, and his sponsor told him, you know, uh, uh, you take Kay home and treat her like a newcomer, you'll have no problems. You'll have no problems. And so in his own way, he was hearing, uh, like me, that expectations get you into trouble. You know, so Mac and I have just treated one another like newcomers, and our relationship is a gift from God. I don't always like what he does, choices he makes, uh, and but I also have learned to give him the permission to not always like me. You know, when I'm, when I'm spiritually disconnected, I'm not very attractive. And uh, so I, I've owned up to that, and I give him permission not to like me. And as a result of that, then I don't have to ever get down and, uh, and, and uh, mess with the respect that I have for him as a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous and a child of God. And that's where I would always go, dismissing any of that, and then I'd hit the road. I'd duck out in the dark of night, and there goes another bad marriage. You know, I just didn't know how to stand still. And But in learning about myself, that seemed to be the key. So Mac and I, um, after we lived together for a long, long time, and I can remember one time throwing a tantrum. I said, I want to go home and be introduced to your uh, mother, to your family. And uh, he was going on a trip. His family lives up here in Arkansas. And uh, he said, no, I'm not taking you. Oh, I rang up my sponsor. I was hot. I mean, this was. This was really bad. And uh, I said, I got something serious to talk to you about. And I said, he's refusing to take me home. And she said, you know, Kay, you have fallen in love with a southern man. And a southern man does not take his live-in home to introduce him to his family. And uh, so, you know, another big piece of reality. And uh, so the day that Mac asked me to marry him, I had to check with him later that day to uh, to understand and believe that he had asked me to marry him. I couldn't remember. I thought, is that just a figment of my imagination, or did he really ask me to marry him? And he said, yes, I did. And so I, you know, I went ahead and we got married. Um, Mac has been absolutely um, the best example of Alcoholics Anonymous that I could possibly um, that I could possibly be close to and see on a daily basis. Uh, he just celebrated 42 years of sobriety. Uh, he's a member in good standing. He still goes to meetings. He uh, He's active. He he gets excited about going to uh, his Chino men's stag group, where his sponsor is, who has, you know, almost 50 years of sobriety. He also attends a meeting with another gentleman. We, in fact, uh, attended the other day a celebration. He was 59 years sober. Max says, you know, I, my, I just have my foot in the door. Uh, but four years ago, uh, Mac had a very, very serious illness, and we thought that he was going to die. And we sat with one another and talked about the integrity that we needed to show as a couple faced with this. And uh, we didn't know who would be watching, but we knew that there would probably be someone watching and it was important to us that we conduct ourselves. He is a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and me is a longtime member in Al-Anon. And we talked about life, and we talked about death. We laughed. We cried. Mac doesn't have uh, anything but a, uh, uh, just a year or so in high school education. Doesn't read very well. And we sat and read um, Tuesdays, uh, uh, Tuesday morning, and and cried some more. And, and uh, we thanked one another for our years together, for uh, him taking 
uh, Stephanie and being a dad to Stephanie and and uh, me for going to work and contributing to the home. I mean, we tried to cover every base because uh, I didn't want to lose him and not be on record with him uh, on how much I appreciated our time together. And uh, Mac had extensive surgery. I've been left too many times in hallways of hospitals, seeing him rolled away, not knowing whether he was going to make it through another surgery or not, and uh, then going downstairs and being in the company of a family member and members of my fellowship. It's been said here before. It'll be said this evening and tomorrow, I'm sure, that we don't have to do anything alone. You know, you promised me that. You said, you know, whether you like it or not, we're not going to leave you alone. And they've been women and men of their word, and they have never, ever left me alone. So I'm so grateful to be able to wish my husband a happy 80th birthday. Together, we did not think that we would see this birthday. And, uh, you know, we, I called him last night, and he wished me well and and uh, was so generous in his in his, what he said to me, and I could feel the generosity of his love through the phone. You know, that's what AA has done for, uh, for Mac. And I want to talk about some small courtesies. You know, I was so self-centered when I got here that I needed to be told that there's a good feeling on the other side of making your bed. There's a good feeling on the other side of keeping your house clean. And, you know, I was always doing it for the other person. I was always doing it to be validated, to hear back, you know, I'm, you're the best. You know, you're the best housekeeper, and you're a good wife. And I never considered myself, ever. You know, my sponsor said to me in the beginning, she said, how do you think it would feel if you cleaned the linens on the bed, and then when you got into them tonight, call me tomorrow and tell me how that felt to you. That's the way she started with me. And uh, and so one of my early courtesies with my husband was whenever I go into the bathroom and I use a towel, I take the wet towel and I put the wet towel over on the other side of the room and he and I always put up a clean, dry towel. I started there. And from there I started not having to go through the door uh, first when I went to the market, for instance. You know, I would hold the door open. If someone dropped something, I would lean down and pick it up for them. If you're struggling out of a jacket in a meeting, I'll lean over and help hold your jacket until you get out of it. Uh, you know, I've learned to do things that make me feel good about me. And in the beginning, had you told me that any of that would have made any difference, oh, I couldn't see how that would have made any difference with me at all. But it's all about how I see myself, how I act these days. I've learned to act differently. My mama uh, suffers from Alzheimer's disease. We brought her home uh, quite a few years ago, and Mac built a little uh, a little place adjacent to our home, built me a little laundry room out there, and I proceeded to take care of my mother, this woman that I didn't particularly care for at all. I've had an awesome uh, opportunity to be my mother's caregiver, and uh, I, t- I had her at home for six and a half years, took care of her every day, and it was not easy. And I was held up and, and uh, reminded from the group that I had all the strength that was needed to take care of my mother. And, uh, and I felt good about the way that I've taken care of her. She's still living today, 93, and I, she's in a care, uh, care facility over in North Hollywood. It takes me a while to drive across town. My sponsor said, that's fine. You can think of how you're going to behave all the way over there. And then coming home, you're all, you're going to thank God that you found your mother safe and clean and and uh, and comfortable. And that's exactly how it's panned out. And uh, you know, I I have been received answers to seemingly tough things all along. And I ask today that obviously God continue to bless us in in more happiness and deeper understanding and personal freedom. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.